archaeologist, philosopher, bonsai aficionado, author, black belt, and squanderer of over 50,000 hours watching B-movies. Using archaeology to dig deep and connect clues, he uses this wealth of useless knowledge to bring you classic snarky movie reviews and world-famous short summaries. Now broadcasting from beautiful downtown Tallahassee, it's Nantan Lupan at the drive-in. Ho, 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 Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, Kicking Kwanzaa, and Festivus for the rest of us. As a special Christmas treat, I put together a podcast about the fantastically bad Santa Claus Conquers the Martians 1964. I hope everyone of all faith and denominations, as well as those that lack either, will enjoy this show. Before I get into this too deeply, I need to make a couple of notes. First, this movie is in the public domain, so you get a slightly different version depending on where you watch it. So don't be too put off if the summary doesn't match scene for scene. Secondly, it's pretty hard to review actors in the film when about 80% of their bios state in the first line that they are best known for this stinker of a movie. But I will endeavor to persevere. Did you get that line? It seems they scavenged whomever they could get that was working on Broadway and hustled them over to an abandoned aircraft hangar on Long Island where the entire movie was shot for around $200,000. Cast John Call was cast in the role of the big man, the jolly elf himself, Santa Claus. And you know what? He did a pretty good job. Anyway, he looked the part. Call seemed to have been around for a while, but only did bit parts. He only made one movie after this. He had a 30-year Broadway career with 19 productions. Leonard Hicks played the role of Kaimar, the head of the Martian Council. I don't know where they found this guy. He only has three credits, including this one. He also did a fair job as a concerned parent and under siege leader. Vincent Beck was cast in the role of the bad guy, Voldar. Before I talk about Beck, let's go over one thing about that name. Voldar was the bad guy? I'm thinking that lady from England that writes thick books may have cheesed this name for her bad guy. The one I shall not name? Beck went from a theater career to TV after this movie. His most well-known movie may be And Justice for All with Al Pacino. Bill McCutcheon played the role of Droppo, the lazy, carefree Martian. McCutcheon had a round face and a droopy mouth that made for a very distinctive look. It turns out he was much more than a rubber-faced comedian. He was wounded in Italy during World War II. Following the war, he graduated from the University of Ohio. He was in several jazz bands and comedy trios and until he started working on the New York stage in the 1950s. He had a successful career in television, in commercials, and an occasional movie. What is even more interesting is that he played Uncle Wally for eight years on Sesame Street and appeared on the back of Mad Magazine two times as Adolf Hitler. I can't make this stuff up. Both Earth children, Victor Stiles as Billy and Donna Conforte as Betty, were child actors on Broadway but did not have a career following this film. One of the two Martian children did a little better. The boy, Chris Munth, who played Beaumar, did not have any more acting credits after this film. Turned out to be P. Zadora's first role as the Martian girl, Germar. In all, Pia had 14 movie and TV credits. She reached her zenith in the mid-1980s with The Lonely Lady, 1983. Perhaps the best-known actor from this movie is Ned Wertmer, who played the role of Andy Henderson, a reporter that interviewed Santa at the North Pole workshop. Workmer is best known because as George and Wheezy moved on up, he was their doorman, Ralph. Ralph was the greedy doorman and should not be confused with Carlton, the drunk doorman from Rhoda. Carlton, your doorman. Doris Rich had a small role as Mrs. Claus. This was the first appearance of Mrs. Claus in a film. Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer came out about three weeks later, but I believe that was straight to television. Doris was married to John Carradine for a time, but they did not have any children together. Carl Don was a Russian-born actor that had 22 movie and TV credits. Nothing really big stands out. In this film, he played two roles. Chokum, the 800-year-old patriarch of Mars, and Von Green, a space scientist. You see what they did there with the name change? Von Braun, Brown, into Green to go with Mars's green men and take away the Nazi sting. I don't know who Gene Lizzie is, and I don't know anything about him. 
I just know that he was uncredited as the polar bear, and it was one of the worst costumes I've ever seen in a movie. And I have seen chihuahuas with carpet on them as giant rats, and a man in a giant bunny costume for Night of the Lepus, so this was spectacularly bad. Story. The movie begins with Ralph the Doorman. And the most frustrating thing, Florence, is that to most people, the job of a doorman seems so simple. Well, ain't it? My stars know. I mean, for starters, the door to this building opens both inward and out, which thereby doubles my responsibilities right off the bat. I never thought of that. Few do. Ned Wertmer as a TV reporter making the first television broadcast from Santa's North Pole workshop. He interviews Santa, John Call, as Santa puffs away at his non-PC pipe. At one point, the reporter asks Santa if he's going to use a rocket sleigh. Santa replies, no siree, we're going to go out the good old-fashioned way, Prancer and Dancer, and Donder and Blitzen, and Vixen and Nixon. Oh, consarn it, I get those names mixed up. But the kids know their names. Many people have stated that this movie is a tale of the Cold War struggle between the U.S. and the Soviets. Invoking the name of Nixon, a McCarthyite and a strong anti-communist, sure adds credence to this interpretation. I'm channeling Spock in Star Trek VI, The Undiscovered Country, stating an old Vulcan adage, quote, that only Nixon can go to China, unquote. I have to step out on a personal rant here. You notice that Santa used the name Donder and Blitzen, which mean thunder and lightning in German? I am appalled when people use Donner. He wasn't trapped on a mountain, for goodness sakes. Three weeks after the release of this movie, Coach Donner and Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer forever muddled those names for generations of Americans. I, for one, am on a moral crusade to restore the literal interpretation of the writing of Clement C. Moore. Santa introduces the reporter to Winky, Ivor Bodine, the elf in charge of the Space Division. Santa shows two products from Winky's area. One is a toy rocket that runs on real jet fuel. It is possible that this rocket is another reference to the Cold War because in 1964 students were still being taught duck and cover and wearing dog tags so their burned bodies could be identified. The second thing they showed is a Martian doll that is a direct replica of the Martians we will see later in this movie. I love foreshadowing. Mrs. Claus, Doris Rich, comes in to put Santa back to work. This is the first known appearance of Mrs. Claus in film. The interview pulls back and is being watched by two very sad Martian children. These Martian children have no toys, just like the little communist children. Obviously, a lot of thought went into this script before they named the boy Martian Bomar and the girl Martian Gaimar, as in boy Martian and girl Martian. Gaimar was played by P. Isadora. As we learned from Doonesbury many years ago, commies love their children too. So Kaimar, Leonard Hicks, as King Martian, and his wife, Momar, Leela Martin, as Mom Martian, are worried about how sad their children are. Spending endless hours watching Xbox. Sorry, I mean Earth Television. They explain that their children are educated with a chip and therefore do not have a childhood. However, it seems to me that they still live as children because they are not working. At this point in the story, they introduce Droppo, Bill McCutcheon. Droppo would be the ant to the communist grasshopper. He was lazy and lived to sleep and was very jovial when they woke him up. Kaimar used some kind of tickle ray to wake Droppo up. I don't know what that's supposed to represent. I kind of gave up. Momar suggested that Kaimar consult with Chochim, Carl Don, because he is 800 years old and is very wise. Kaimar radios the High Council, or Politburo if you want. He immediately gets crap from Voldar, Vincent Beck. First he won't answer the radio, then he shows up late to meet with Cochim. So you know this guy's going to be a pain for the rest of the movie. Cochim explains to the group that kids need a childhood. He's been seeing them get this way for years as the Earth Christmases draw near. They decide that they must go to Earth and kidnap Santa Claus. Everyone agrees except Voldemort. Uh, I mean, correction, Voldar. Oh, by the way, Voldar is darker than the other Martians and has a big Joe Stalin mustache. Santa Claus on Mars? Will we get a Santa Claus? There's only one Santa Claus, and he's an Earth. 
Well, I guess that takes care of that. Didn't I tell you it was a foolish idea to seek advice from that old man? This is a serious matter, Voldar. And desperate problems require desperate deeds. Earth has had Santa Claus long enough. We will bring him to Mars. I'm against it. Our children are fine the way they are. I don't want any Santa Claus bringing them toys and games. They'll start playing and laughing and running underfoot. They'll become a nuisance. I've made my decision. We leave for Earth tonight. The Martians jump into their spaceship, and apparently it takes four people to fly. They arrive over New York City, and using their periscope, they see that a Santa Claus is on every corner. They figure this is going to be pretty easy to do, since there are so many Santa Clauses. The Martians detect radar beams and try to turn on their anti-radar device. They find out that Droppo is stowed away in the anti-radar box. When they get him out, the beam starts working. The Earth News announces, quote, Here's another UFO bulletin. The Defense Department has just announced that the unidentified flying object suddenly disappeared from our radar screen. They believe the object has either disintegrated in space, or it may be a spaceship from another world which has the ability to nullify all radar beams, unquote. That's a pretty wide logic jump. It couldn't be from this planet. It couldn't be something else that either burned up or turned on a nullification ray. Just for reference, remember that the UFO scare started after World War II, and a lot of it has been tied to the Cold War since then with SR-71 blackbirds flying around and what have you. Oh yeah, there's the little green men they found at Roswell too. They land their craft in stealth mode near a little lake in what I assume to be Central Park. This movie was set in the 60s, so kids could play out there by themselves. The Martians quickly run into Billy and his sister Betty. The two kids have heard the UFO report and are not really that shocked when they see the Martians coming over and start asking them questions about Santa. They immediately tell the Martians that the real Santa lives at the North Pole and all those others are just helpers. Talk about aiding and abetting. The Martians decide to kidnap the kids so no one will know who kidnapped Santa. It's not like the Earth people could do anything about it anyway. On the ship, the Martians place these hostages under the watchful eye of Droppo. Great plan. Superior beings, I think not. The first thing that Droppo does is take the kids to the control deck. Droppo shows the kids the anti-radar device. When they hear Voldar coming, the kids hide in the anti-radar box like Droppo did. The kids overhear the whole plan how the Martians are going to kidnap Santa Claus and take the two children to Mars with them. When the ship lands at the North Pole, the two children escape after Billy disables the radar machine and try and make it to Santa's workshop to warn him. Four leaders get out and stay around the spaceship discussing their plans. Since the children are not dressed as Arctic explorers, they quickly get in trouble and have to hide in a cave. That's when they are attacked by a guy in the worst polar bear costume I'd ever seen. Back at the ship, Kamar decides he doesn't want to take a chance and calls for his robot, Tor. Tor seems to be an early version of Siri. Get out of the ship. I said, get out of the ship. No, I don't need a reminder to buy lettuce. Get out of the ship. Anyway, this robot is the slowest Tinker Toy model, and I don't see why he would be helpful. Tor gets the children and takes them back to the ship. The Martians go to Santa's workshop, where they decide they are going to surround the building and send the robot in after Santa. The three Martians and the robot all go immediately to the front door. Tor breaks through the front door in pre-classic Bumble style. Remember, Rudolph is not out yet. Never knew the Bumble Snow Monster yet who turned down a pork dinner for dear me. Do your stuff. I'm dying. Put some heart in it. That Bumble's hungry. I'm I, 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 I. Santa sees Tor as a big toy and completely disables the robot by treating him as a toy, much like he did with the Bumble. The Martians break in with their ray guns, which are really just whammo air guns painted black. A blast of air is powerful fun. And now, the most powerful force in the world, wind power, is inside Whammo's air blaster. Unbelievable, but true. You blast out the air and the target breaks up. Blow in the wind with the air compression lever and blow out candles across the room. It's invisible, this magic power to surprise, to tease. The elves immediately grab baseball bats to defend Santa. That's how I want my boys to roll. The Martians use the ray to freeze the elves, and when Mrs. Claus comes out, they freeze her as well. 
The Martians take Santa to the ship and he is imprisoned with the children. On Earth, Mrs. Claus reports that the Martians definitely took Santa. The United Nations goes into all-night session and NASA sends a rescue attempt, but the Martians fix their anti-radar and evade. Dr. Green says, All the American astronauts all want to go after those Martian monkeys. On the way to Mars, everyone's getting in the Christmas spirit except Voldar. He tries to blast Santa and the two Earth kids out the airlock as if they were Cylon clones. Santa uses his magic to get everyone out of the air vent. When they land on Mars, they find that Voldar has escaped and left Droppo in his cell. On Mars, Santa meets the two Martian children and they're immediately taken with him. They all have a ho-ho-ho giggle fest. Kaimar sets up a factory for Santa, which is totally automated, and he doesn't need the elves to make toys. Droppo, the two Earth children, and the two Martian children begin working at the factory. Santa is not happy with his new role once he finds he is never going home. The two Martian kids grow happier and happier while the two Earth kids fall into a sullen funk. Momar wants to send them back to Earth, but her husband refuses. Droppo debos a Santa suit and uses a pillow for the belly. He goes to the workshop at the same time Voldar and his two henchmen show up. They sabotage the wiring and kidnap Droppo thinking he is Santa. The green skin is somehow not a giveaway. They take Droppo to the caves to question him, but he answers ho 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 to every question. Voldar heads back to the workshop to demand an end to the Santa Claus stuff, stating that he will kill Santa Claus if he is denied. Kamar locks him up because he knows they have Droppo instead of Santa Claus. At the same time, Droppo escapes. Shortly after, Voldar escapes, but Billy hears the plan. Billy's a sneaky little curse. Santa leads all of the kids in an old-fashioned Donnybrook. The kids are using all of the toys to defeat the forces of evil. There are a lot of toy tanks, rockets, soldiers, and baseball bats. Droppo shows up and Kamar saves him and stops the attack on the now-beaten Voldar. Droppo starts ho-ho-hoing and they decide he's the real Martian Santa. They all say their goodbyes. Droppo Claus comes in and cheers the Martians up as Santa and the two kids head back to Earth in time for Christmas Eve. World famous summary. America's greatest capitalist, Santa Claus, defeats the commies slash Martians. Thanks for listening today. Remember you can drop by iTunes to subscribe or drop by snarkymoviereviews.com if you want to see my site. I want to give a special thanks to Steve, Craig, with a K, Sharice, David, and Josephine. Ho, ho, ho.